So here's just some goofy thing. Uh, so I, when I wrote this down earlier, I failed, and because uh, I was copying down from a piece of paper without thinking. Uh, but I've just so something I something I learned at some point when I was a PhD student was that sometimes in life you're faced with you're faced with equations like that. In fact, the, sometimes in life you're faced with equations like this equals question mark, and you need to decide how you're going to let g act on your space of fees in order to make this an action. Uh, you see, so there's a there's there's the thing I wrote down, and now there's this implicit lemma that uh, how do I check that pi one of g two Sorry, the pi of g1, g2 equals pi of g1 composed with pi of g2, right? I've got to check that, because if that's not true, then I haven't written down a representation of my group. So <laughs> let me just make the following kind of stupid observation. Uh, so of course, you know how to do that, right? That's, that's five lines of algebra. But let me show you how to do it in your head without having to do any lines of algebra at all. So firstly, kind of pi is irrelevant, right? I could just use, I could just use g dot phi uh, to be the action of g on phi. I don't have to use notation pi at all. I could just define multiplication of g and phi to be like that, right? So I need to check that, I need to check that if that's the definition. Uh, so now you see I have to be careful with associativity, right? So now the question is, is it true that g1, g2, phi equals g1, g2, phi, right? That's what the question is. So the question is, can I just move the brackets around, right? So that's what I've got to check. Uh, and you can kind of see that that's kind of going to be messy, because then you have to somehow think about things, and then the g hops from over here to over here. But the reason it's messy is because we have a crummy, we have a, we have a system in maths where typically you might write maps on the left, right? If I've got some function from x to y, then the usual notation is f of x, right? But you don't have to use that notation. You could use this notation instead, right? Maps on the right. And that's kind of a really stupid notation that confuses people, and I've met algebraists that kind of swear by it. And you just kind of look at them and think, why are you doing that? Uh, but it turns out that the best idea, just like it's best to know two ways of multiplying matrices together, it's best to always remember that maps, even though it's kind of a stupid place to put maps, maps can go on the right if you like. So in this situation here, if I'd let, if phi, if I consider all those maps phi to have the property that we map phi on the right, then my definition becomes this, right? Because remember, g of phi is g acting on phi. g of phi is supposed to be a function, right? So I, there's my definition, OK? And now you look at my definition, and you're kind of thinking, this actually looks much better now, doesn't it? Because what we actually have to prove you see, is we have to prove that kind of g1, g2, phi equals g1, g2, phi, right? And what does that mean? Well, that means to check these two functions are the same, it means we kind of, it means if we evaluate them at h using the same convention, if we evaluate them at h, we get the same answer. So we've got to check that this equals this, and this, <laughs> and this is what we know. And what we know just means you can move brackets around however you like. So let's just move the brackets around however you like. And all we've got to do now is you've just got to check that these two things are the same. You see? And it works really well. And so you can do it. So, that's, so you can do it in your head. That was just kind of a, I don't know, it took me years to realize that that's the point. That's, you, maps can go on the right. And sometimes it's a really cool idea. So anyway. So that's the proof that this is an action. Uh, <laughs> and now we've got to understand. So there we go. Uh, so lemma, this is an action. This is a representation of GL2 of K. Proof. Maps on the right. Uh, but now what we really want to do is we want to prove this of the kind that we've been talking about, right? Uh, is it smooth? Is it smooth, admissible, 
and irreducible? Well, those are interesting questions. Uh, and it's not always irreducible, in fact. Uh, but it is going to be smooth and admissible. So one key, one, before, we, before we launch into all this, uh, I need to just kind of tell you a key fact. It's a kind of a key, really useful fact. So here's a really useful lemma that I knew I'd proved somewhere, but it took me a while to find. Uh, here's a lemma. Is that, uh, so if B, let's let B, uh, let's let B of K be the upper triangular matrices. Uh, upper triangular matrices, very easy to check that that's a subgroup. Okay? Uh, then, uh, and it turns out that uh, GL2 of K is just equal to B of K times GL2 of OK. Now, in group theory, you've got to be a little bit careful because what do I mean by this dot, right? Because uh, this is a random subgroup, not remotely normal. And this is a random subgroup of GL2 of K, not remotely normal. And what do I mean by this dot? Do I just mean like the group generated by these two subgroups? Uh, because that might be very different to the subset of G you get if you just take an element here and an element here and multiply them together. So let me just stress that I do mean that weakest possible thing. Right? Uh, I'm claiming that GL2 of K really does equal uh, the set of B times G for B in B of K and G in GL2 of OK. Right? I'm saying that every matrix, every two by two matrix, is an upper triangular matrix times a matrix with integer entries. And this is kind of nice to know, because if I've got a locally constant function on a compact set like this, uh, then it's only going to take finitely many values, you see. Because it's locally constant, so it's certainly continuous. Uh, I'm going to put the discrete. As you can see, as we're constantly doing in this course, the C has got the discrete topology here, right? These maps are locally constant. So uh, I guess that's actually another way of saying that they're continuous if I put the discrete topology on the complex numbers and I put the usual p-adic topology on GL2 of k. So these functions are continuous, and a continuous function on a continuous image of a compact set is compact, and a compact subset of the complexes with the discrete topology is finite. Right? So the reason this lemma is going to be useful, so maybe I should say, so I'll prove the lemma. The proof, the proof is, of course, just mucking around with two by two matrices. So maybe I'll say the, the whole point of it. So the remark is uh, that this means that phi, if I've got phi from GL2 of k, to C, locally constant, uh, that implies that phi is kind of continuous with respect to the discrete topology on C, right? And therefore, phi of GL2 of OK, uh, phi of G of OK can only take finitely many values, is finite, and phi of, and phi of BK, you see that somehow controlled that's controlled by this other axiom here, right? And phi of and phi of B K controlled by a uh, by the definition of I chi one by the definition of I chi one chi two. You see, so I'm saying uh, if you think about a general element of G L two of K as being as being this times this, then you can see. This action of B of K on the left, we can kind of control. We know what it does to phi. And on the right, we've got a compact set, so things can't be too bad. Uh, so this is the kind of observation that's going to be really useful. Things like admissibility of finiteness statements, right? And you see we've got some kind of finiteness statement out. So let me prove the lemma. Uh, it's true for GLN. Uh, what I'm going to do is I've, I've got the GLN proof, and I'm somehow specializing it to GL2. Uh, so this is kind of kind of look a bit funny, but it's relatively simple. And uh, 
So here's the proof. Uh, so let's say A, B, C, D. Uh, is in GL2 of K. So we want to find, we want kind of beta in B of K and kappa in GL2 of OK, such that, such that ABCD, oops, such that ABCD is just beta times kappa. Right, that's what we're after. Uh, so what I'm going to do, so maybe I'll call this gamma. What I'm just going to do now is I'm going to slightly modify gamma by either multiplying it on the left by an element of B of K or multiplying it on the right by an element of GL2 of K, because I can do those. If I keep modifying it and eventually I get the identity, then we're going to be done. Uh, so firstly, uh, firstly let me scale. So, so by left, so left multiply Uh, by det gamma inverse zero zero one, there that implies that wool log gamma is in uh, SL two of k. You see, because I'm trying to write every element of GL two of k as beta times kappa, but but the point is that this is in this is in B of k, so I multiply on the left, and uh, so I can change the determinant. So wool log Gamma is in SL2 of K, and now I'm going to do another change. Uh, so now choose alpha, choose, well, choose some alpha in K star, scaling factor, so I'm going to scale C and D, uh, such, that, such that alpha C and alpha D, C and D are random elements of K, uh, but I can scale them and so they're in OK. So this, maybe I should say this gamma is still A, B, C, D. Choose some random element of K star, such that alpha C and alpha D are in OK. And furthermore, I can assume that one of them is a unit. And at least one is a unit. Uh, the reason I can do that, the only time, if you've got two numbers uh, that you, in K, you can always scale so that they're both in OK. Uh, but if you want to make sure at least one of them is a unit, you better make sure that C and D weren't both zero, because then you can't do that. But you see, if C and D were both zero, this matrix wouldn't be invertible. So this is OK. Uh, so I choose alpha in K star, such that alpha C and alpha D are units. And then, and now I left multiply by a diagonal matrix. That's the kind I find hard. So all you B people, you'll need to think very carefully about the next line. But all you regular A people, We'll find it very easy. Uh, so I left multiply by alpha inverse zero zero alpha. You see, because that changes C and D to alpha C and alpha D. So this implies kind of wool log gamma equals A B C D is now in S L two of K, and C and D are integral. Are integral. And at least one is at least one is a unit. Yeah. Uh, so there's two more steps. Uh, the next step is I want C to be a unit. Uh, and so what about if D? What about it turned out if D was a unit and C wasn't? Uh, so. So next step, if C isn't a unit, if D is a unit and C isn't a unit, then we right multiply by kind of 0, 1, negative 1, 0. Uh, and that switches switches C and D round. And that's the point is that's in GL2 of OK, so that's OK. 
So that switch is seen. He also changes the sign. So hence we'll log uh, C as a unit. C and D are integers, and C is a unit. And now the last step is I'm just going to do it in the case that C is a unit. Uh, last step. Uh, note that 1 minus A over C, 0, 1, multiplied by A, B, C, D. So this is the matrix that we're trying to prove the thing about, right? This is a random matrix, but we've now manipulated it so that C and D are integral and C is a unit. And now I'm multiplying on the left by an element of the Borel, uh, the upper triangular matrices. I've got 1 over C, but that's fine because uh, uh, C is in OK star, so it's certainly in K star. And we do that multiplication, and if I got it right, uh, it's going to be, let's do it again just to be sure, 0, C, uh, well, I know the determinant is 1, so this must be negative 1 over C, uh, and this is D. And that's in GL2 of OK. You see, so I've done it. So that means that this thing here is the inverse of this times this, and that's in upper triangular, and that's got integral entries. So there's the proof of the lemma. So what's actually going on more conceptually uh, is that there's some, uh, there's some vial group. Uh, that switch there, this is some representative of a vial group element. And if you try to prove this for GLN, then you'll see some symmetric group, SN, showing up. Uh, so the proof would involve some permutations and then some, and then some trick like this. Uh, so that's a really useful fact. Uh, and. And using that fact now, most things become ex most things become relatively simple exercises, which you should probably do actually. Now then, that's done that. So now I go back to five pages ago, and now I think that my notes are actually uh, going to be in a linear format. Right, great. So, so recall. Here's this I of chi 1, chi 2. Phi from GL2 of K to C, which are continuous, uh, and phi of whatever, A, B, 0, D, G, is chi 1 of A, chi 2 of D, times norm of A over D, square root, uh, times, times phi of G. Uh, and I've given you all the details now. I've given you all the information you need to prove the following rather pleasant exercise. This is I of chi 1, chi 2. Is indeed smooth and admissible. So that's a really good exercise to do. Uh, I was always very uncomfortable about this definition because of this stupid factor here. <laughs> In fact, this is, a, this is the source of a mistake I made earlier, right? I stated the local Langlands conjectures uh, rather sloppily at the end of yesterday. Because uh, I just wanted to get them, I wanted to get them on the board before we went for the hike, in case I never came back. And <laughs> uh, but I just let E be kind of a pretty arbitrary algebraically, a pretty arbitrary field, and I think that was a little bit over optimistic. And one of the reasons I think it's over optimistic is that there's an issue of how one normalizes the local Langlands correspondence. And you can't have every, it's one of these cases where you can't have everything. You can't normalize absolutely everything so that it all works out exactly. There's, just, there, there's some 
some, at some point you need fudge factors to make things work out. And this is a fudge factor. Uh, remember, it's a, this, this norm is this kind of canonical norm, right? This is this thing here, right? Uh, the norm of pi k is 1 over qk. That's this norm we're talking about. So this is just a number, right? Uh, but we are taking its square root, you see. So it's kind of important that we have the square root of... Do you see if the, there's an issue, right? If q was actually, say, equal to a prime number, p, uh, then at some point we'll involve taking the square root of p. So you kind of need to make sure that your field has got a square root of p in. That's why it's sort of sensible, you know, it's, it's sort of safe to take the... Uh, safe to take the complex numbers. Uh, I guess for a general random e, you need to be clear which square root of p you've chosen. You need to stick with that choice all the way as well. Right? Uh, but you don't need it, right? So here's kind of dumb observation. Is that uh, this norm of A over D, right? This norm A over D half is just the norm of A, right? Divided by the norm of D, right? And so you can actually just feed them, you know, so I could define, I could just set kind of chi 1 tilde I could just modify chi 1 tilde, right? Chi 1 tilde can go from k star to c star. Chi 1 tilde, chi 1 tilde of x can just be kind of chi 1 of x, literally multiplied by this norm of x to the, to the half, right? And chi 2 tilde, chi tilde tilde of x can be chi 2 of x, kind of divided by the norm of x to the half, right? So I'm just kind of modifying... And then, and then you see, and then, then this line becomes kind of phi of a, b, zero, a, b, zero, d, g. It's just kind of chi one tilde of a times chi two tilde of d times phi of g, right? You know, then that stupid factor has gone away, you see. So it looks like it's a kind of, a, kind of crappy definition. It looks like we should, you know, we can, we can th that's a random fudge factor, and we could incorporate the fudge factor into the characters, and then we wouldn't even have to mention it, and we'd have a slightly simpler definition of i chi 1 chi 2, right? Hello. So, so yeah, you could do that. Yeah, yeah. Well, you see, because, yeah, nothing. <laughs> So we could have I naive, right? I naive of chi 1, comma chi 2. Just don't use the factors, right? Don't use, don't, use, don't use that norm of A over D to the half, right? Let's call that I naive chi 1, chi 2, i.e. non-normalized. Non and this argument I've just shown you here, I mean, I've answered your question before you asked it, right? Because, like, I naive... of kind of chi 1 times the norm to the half, chi 2 times the norm to the minus a half, is actually physically equal to, it's literally the same set of functions with the same action, i of chi 1, chi 2, right? And I've not changed, like, chi 1 and chi 2 are just random continuous characters, and the norm is a perfectly good random continuous characters, as is its square root, assuming you choose a square root of p, and don't start goofing around with it and changing it. Like, you can't, use, you can't use the positive square root of p here and the negative square root of p here. You've got to, you've got to be clear that uh, this is not just taking a random square root, so it's making some fixed... We're making a fixed choice here. Uh, but this answers your question, right? There's, oh, it doesn't answer your question? Well, I don't understand your question, then. You said, is this still smooth and miscible? Well, I'm saying, sure, apply the fact that it's smooth. This is smooth and miscible, and that's true for all chi 1 and chi 2, and I can just m modify them, right? Yeah, why are we making life so complicated? Yeah, I, couldn't, I didn't know that for a long time. Uh, and one day I wrote down some notes called principal series notes. Uh, where I tried to figure this out. So here's a great example of why... Let me, let me first show you how completely stupid we're being making life so complicated, right? So, uh, so here's a question, right? 
is I of chi 1, comma, chi 2 irreducible? Okay? There's a question. And the answer to that question is no. Uh, and the proof is really, really easy if we don't use this stupid normalization, right? So this is easy. The answer is no. And I'll show you why. Let's do I naive, right? So I naive, this is the definition of I naive. It's just the same definition as I, but uh, no, it's the, what am I doing? Where's, where's my I naive? Uh, I don't have an I naive. <laughs> Hard luck. So let me, um, I think, right, so let's define I naive of chi 1, comma, chi 1, comma chi 2 is exactly the functions phi from GL2 of k to C such that phi of A, B, 0, D of G is chi 1 of A, chi 2 of D, uh, times 5g. Okay? So this is all locally constant, of course. There's my, there's my I naive. And now look, I'll prove it for I naive. Because, okay, so remember that I naive. Uh, so just unraveling the definitions, so recall, I naive, chi 1 comma chi 2, equals I, literally equals chi 1 norm yeah, minus a half norm, oh, chi 2, chi 2 times norm to the plus a half, right? Uh, because we throw these in and then we do the non-naive thing with the stupid factors and the factors will magically cancel. Okay? So the collection of all I naives we get is the same as the collection of all I's. But I naive is easier to work with because this stupid fudge factor isn't here. So here's the following observation. Note, if, kind of, if uh, chi 1 equals chi 2 is the trivial representation. You see, what, what this calculation is inspired from is the following. Uh, if you've done enough representation theory, you'll know that uh, you've got a group G and you've got a subgroup H, maybe a finite index subgroup, maybe all your groups are finite. You've got a finite index subgroup H of G, you've got a representation of H, you can induce it up and get a representation of G. Uh, and if the representation of H is quite complicated, then the induction to G could well end up irreducible. But if the representation of H is quite easy, for example, if it's the trivial representation, then the induced representation of G might not be so complicated, right? So there's this thing called Frobenius reciprocity. So H living in, let's say all groups are finite, so there's a subgroup H of G, and uh, I've got chi some character of H, right? So chi the trace of a representation of H, so this is a character of H. And then there's this thing called induced chi, in chi, that's now a representation of G. Uh, this is a character of G. And then there's this Frobenius reciprocity, right? Ind chi, ind chi comma rho equals chi comma res rho. So I certainly, I mean, I saw this as an undergraduate, so maybe this makes sense to many of you. Uh, so here's a kind of a trivial observation. If chi is the trivial representation of H, uh, then I claim that ind chi is unlikely to be irreducible, because if chi is the trivial one-dimensional representation of H, its induction will be a big representation of G, and yet, if I let rho be trivial, right, ind chi of 1 is chi comma res of 1, which is chi comma 1, and if chi is 1, then this is 1, right? So ind 1, 1 is 1, res 1 is 1, 1, which is 1. So in particular, if I induce the trivial representation, I'm very unlikely to get something irreducible because the induction will contain the trivial one-dimensional representation of G. So that's what's happening here, right? If chi 1 equals chi 2 is the trivial representation, I've got to think of functions phi satisfying this kind of complicated equation. But if chi 1 and chi 2 are trivial, I can just remove them as well, right? And I'm, because I'm doing the naive thing, I've removed the fudge factor, which was going to stop me doing this calculation. The fudge factor is gone. Chi 1 is gone. Chi 2 is gone. It says 5 something times g is 5g. Okay. Then I naive... then I naive of chi 1 comma chi 2 contains the constant functions. Right? 
And these are one-dimensional G-invariant subspace. There. And more generally, if chi 1 equals chi 2, uh, then you can check that uh, if chi 1 equals chi 2, then there's a one-dimensional invariant subspace as well for the same sort of reasons. Uh, more generally, if chi 1 equals chi 2, then, uh, then I naive of chi 1, comma, chi 1, comma, chi 2 uh, contains, contains an invariant one-dimensional sub. Right? So this is sort of a pleasant exercise. So these, these calculations are really, really easy to do without that stupid fudge factor, okay, which really kind of makes you wonder, especially if, you know, if, like me, you saw this definition and then you decide to go away and try and check for yourself that these representations are smooth and irreducible. You'll really start getting a feeling for what these things look like. And the more you get a feeling doing these calculations on an elementary level, the more you realize that every single line of every calculation you write has got this stupid fudge factor in that's playing no role at all. And you really wonder why it's there. I have a question about the fudge factor. Yeah. Um, so over here with I naive, it says that it's multiplied the left by any element of GL2. Yeah. What, what, what? This, no, this should be a z this is this That thing that obviously looks like a C is supposed to be a zero, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm always saying, I'm somehow, if you've ever seen explicitly how to build, what I'm doing here is I'm, this is a model for a representation. We have a wonder, what's going on really is the pair chi1, comma chi2 is a one-dimensional representation of B. Okay? Uh, chi1, comma chi2 sends an upper triangular matrix AB, 0, D to chi1 of A times chi2 of D or if we're not being naive, times some stupid fudge factor. Uh, and what we're doing here, I'm explicitly writing down a model for the induction of that representation up to GL2. Uh, so as I say, and if you've seen, there's lots of ways of defining induction. There's lots of ways of defining induction, but one way, uh, one way looks very much like this. You get functions on the big group taking values in the small representation that transform in a certain way under the smaller group. Uh, oh, I just wrote that, didn't I? So these things are not always irreducible, and the easiest way to see that is to uh, use the non, is to use the non-naive thing. Uh, But it turns out, uh, turns out there's another case. So it turns out there's another case. Uh, there's another class of examples where i chi one, where i chi one chi two is not irreducible. And if you use the naive, this is why, this is when the naive thing starts falling down. Uh, I can't even remember the answer. The answer is something like, uh, it's something like, if, um, if chi 1 divided by chi 2 is either, is either the square of the norm, or possibly, uh, the inverse square. It's an exercise to find out what the answer is. Uh, but I've gone, I've gone off lectures, so. Uh, if the ratio of chi 1 and chi 2, you see, we did the case when the ratio of chi 1 of chi 2 were trivial, uh, then I naive has a sub. If the ratio is the either the square or the inverse square of the, of the norm character on K, so this is this usual ca canonical norm on K, then I naive. Chi one comma chi two 
has a one-dimensional quotient, and so this this is quite hard to see. Uh, and this is I find this result quite incomprehensible. On so, in some so there's two cases. There's two cases when this naive induced representation is not irreducible. And one of them is when chi 1 equals chi 2. And the other one is when the ratio of chi 1 and chi 2 is some random thing that I can't quite remember. Uh, I, can, I can certainly work. In fact, what we say will easily be able to work it out. Uh, so there you go. And this has a one dimensional quotient. So, why, so something weird has happened, right? What's happened here? Uh, is that there's a duality going on that I'm suppressing, right? There's a duality. Okay, it turns out that there's a very natural pairing uh, between i chi 1 comma chi 2 cross i of chi 2 comma chi 1, sorry, chi 2, uh, no, it's chi 1 inverse comma chi 2 inverse uh, to C. So the pairing involves an integral on G, right, involving a, on G and on B, which is this star, star, zero, star. So you integrate with respect to some Haar measure. So I'm not going to go into the details of this. Uh, so this is the non-naive one. Uh, but when you do these integrals, at some point you change variables. Uh, at some point you involve you need to change a left Haar measure. a left Haar measure on, on B to a right Haar measure. And unfortunately, because B is quite an annoying group, the left and right Haar measures do not coincide, and they differ by a fudge factor. Involving this A over D. So you end up with a fudge factor here to make this pairing work, and you realize that the thing to do, if you did this with the naive ones, you would have this stupid fudge factor, and you decide to fix the fudge factor by kind of sharing it equally between the two representations. So you end up with a square root of it on each side. So this explains, this is where it comes from. It makes the jewel. It makes the jewel of um, the jewel of i chi one chi two equal to i of chi one inverse chi two inverse. You see. So if you don't have the fudge factor, then at some point when you were doing some basic calculation, looking at linear functions on this and producing elements on this, where you have to switch. Uh, we have to switch. So here, you see, you really are working over the complexes. You're doing kind of little integrals. They're just finite sums in disguise. We'll maybe see some little integrals later. Uh, but that's really all and more that I want to say about the fudge factor. Uh, so that's why it's there. Uh, so, so the dual of the dual of kind of I naive of chi 1 comma chi 2 will be something like will be something like i naive kind of chi 1 inverse times the norm and then chi 2 inverse times norm inverse or something you get different you'll get different things trying to compensate for this fudge factor so you see it's kind of not so pretty 
and then you see, so this is, I mean, I might have got these signs wrong. This, this might be a minus one, and this is a plus one, because I'm just making this up at this point. Uh, but you see, chi one equals chi two is some kind of degenerate situation where this thing isn't irreducible. Uh, but in this language, that now corresponds to chi one inverse equaling chi two inverse. And so, but norm doesn't equal norm inverse, so you get some weird, you know. Some calculations, it just works best to have that fudge factor in. So I'm going to put the fudge factor in, and you're just going to have to deal with it. And whenever you do calculations, you might want to let line one of your calculation be, why don't I replace chi 1 by chi 1 times the square root of the norm, and chi 2 by chi 2 divided by the square root of the norm. And then the fudge factor is gone. Uh, bless you. So I've given you an example where i of chi 1, chi 2 is definitely not irreducible, and I've said that if you believe in some duality, then this must give you some dual example. But it turns out those are the exa only examples. So this was a little bit too tricky to prove. Uh, but uh, So it turns out that I of this i of chi 1 comma chi 2 actually is irreducible. If chi 1, if chi 1 divided by chi 2 is not equal to norm to the plus or minus 1. You see? That's, that's the justification, right? That seems to me like a quite a nice justific a preliminary justification of this weird fudge factor. Because if you take out the fudge factor and we do I naive of chi 1, chi 2, the two bad cases are when the ratio is trivial and when the ratio is either the square or the reciprocal of the square of the norm. I've forgotten which one because I don't care. Okay, because I'm kind of convinced that the fudge factor is worth carrying around because we get clean results like this. Uh, so I think that's probably too hard for you to prove, but uh, you can imagine... Uh, you could imagine attempting to prove it somehow. Uh, but this is an exercise. In fact, I've, I mean, I've basically done the, I've mentioned the exercise already, right? Uh, exercise, if the ratio, if chi 1 divided by chi 2 is indeed norm inverse, uh, then we get a one-dimensional sub, then, so I'll tell you the answer. Uh, I mentioned already, I, I gave the example when chi 1, when chi 1, when you use the naive normalizations, if chi 1 equal chi 2, then there's a one dimensional sub. And so using the non naive normalizations, if the ratio is the reciprocal of the uh, norm, uh, then we get 0 goes to a one dimensional representation. Uh, goes to i of chi 1, chi 2, goes to a quotient which we haven't got a name for yet. Uh, so let's call it s of chi 1, chi 2. Goes to 0. And what is this one-dimensional representation? This is a one-dimensional representation of GL2 of k, of course. So what is it? And I'll tell you what it is. It's, um, uh, it's actually g goes to... Uh, chi 1 tensor norm k to the power of half composed with debt of g. Well, that's what it is. g is in gl2 of k, but debt g is in gl1 of k, so I can apply a character to it. See, there's no chi 2 here, but that's okay, because chi 2 is determined by chi 1. Yeah, so this is also chi 2 times norm to the minus a half. Uh, so that's not so difficult to check. Uh, you know, the hint is just translate it back to a naive statement and then just do the calculations there. Or, uh, or just plow through and carry the silly fudge factor all the way through the calculation. Uh, but again, something you can't check. I've told you that uh, these i's are irreducible. Uh, apart from this case. And in this case, when you're pulling off this one-dimensional sub, the S is irreducible. Uh, 
and is a fact. In this case, we have S of chi 1. I could put chi 2, but somehow chi 2 has a name, right? It's uh, chi 2. Chi 2 is automatically, by definition, it's chi 1 times the norm here, right? Uh, is irreducible. I don't know, I mean, you could try and prove these things. I don't know relatively painless proofs. Uh, so there's the, one, there's the one missing case, right? Chi 1 over chi 2. What about if chi 1 over chi 2 is norm to the plus 1? And then, as I say, the trick is then uh, that uh, if you take the dual of this representation, the ratio is then norm to the minus 1. So this applies to the dual. So you'll be unsurprised to hear. Uh, so this last thing is that if chi 1 over chi 2 is norm to the plus 1, then, uh, then there's an exact sequence mentioning this same, mentioning this same S. Uh, and it goes 0. If I got it right, it goes 0 to S of chi 2 comma chi 1. I haven't defined S of chi 1 comma chi 2 for arbitrary chi 1 and chi 2, right? We're, we, this definition of S only makes sense when chi 1 over chi 2 is norm to the minus 1. But you can observe that if chi 1 over chi 2 is norm to the plus 1, then chi 2 over chi 1 is norm to the minus 1. So this makes sense. Uh, and this now goes to i of chi 1 comma chi 2. And this now goes to the one-dimensional representation, whatever, chi 2 times norm to the half, composed with the debt. And that goes to 0. Uh, so as I say, this is because kind of I of chi 1 comma chi 2, there's some kind of duality, and the dual of this is I chi 1 inverse comma chi 2 inverse. So this is theorem 1.21, I think. Theorem 1.21 of the Bernstein-Zelewinski paper, if you're interested. Oops. Uh, So Bernstein and Zelovinsky, if you want to know more about this, the foundations of this stuff, Bernstein and Zelovinsky wrote a lovely article uh, where they set up a huge general theory of representations for kind of locally compact, totally disconnected groups, like GLN of K. Uh, and then slowly they put more and more conditions on this group, you know, various finite list conditions. And, you know, they prove things like Scher's lemma and blah, blah, blah. And then eventually they specialise to GLN of a periodic field, or GLN of an arbitrary local field, I think. Uh, and they start proving basic stuff like this. You know, in, they have kind of chi 1 up to chi n, right? You can take the Borel subgroup of GLN and take n characters of that and try and induce it up. And they say things about how this group breaks up and things. Some very basic kind of calculations going on in that paper. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not, a, not a difficult read, really, to a large extent. Uh, so I've just given you a whole host of random representations of GL2 of k, right? We've got i of chi 1, chi 2, if the ratio isn't plus or minus the norm. Uh, if the ratio is plus or minus the norm, we've got this one, and we've got these one-dimensional representations. But uh, here's a mind-blowing, there's another construction. Uh, now let, me, now let me just say essentially nothing. Now let me say epsilon about a completely different construction. So the, the place you learn about this completely different construction is section one of Jacquet and Langlands, which is, like the rest of the book, completely unreadable. Oh, talking, talking of which, so my stalker Brian, hi Brian, my, my stalker Brian emails me last night and says, smooth, smooth, and, smooth and irreducible applies admissible by a theorem of Jacquet. 
and gives me the... You know, I was moaning that I couldn't remember why it was true. And he gave me a reference. So, uh, thanks, Brian. It's the theorem of Jacquet. Uh, so, Jacquet proved smooth and irreducible implies admissible. Uh, actually, in the, for GLN of K, certainly, but for a general connected reductive group over K. Uh, so section one of Jacquet and Langlands. This is a really, really difficult. If, you've ever, if you ever go and have a look at it, it's a really difficult book to read. It has all the information in, but somehow it needs to be rewritten by something else, by someone else, and that hasn't really happened. Uh, Langlands wrote a seminal paper about representations of real. Langlands proved the local Langlands conjectures for GLN of the reals and GLN of the complexes. Turns out one can make some kind of statement for them. Like the Vey groups are all completely different, and the representations are kind of Banach space representations. You have to be careful. Uh, but Langlands formulated a local Langlands conjecture for GLN over the reals and the complexes and proved it. And the proof is kind of very hard analysis and very difficult to read. Uh, but People like Merglan of Alsperger actually kind of took his work and just kind of rewrote it in a way that they hoped people would be more likely to read. So there's a kind of a rewriting of that paper. It's in French, but somehow that's not as bad as being written by Langlands. So <laughs> <laughs> it turns out. <laughs> so, so Jack A. Langlands, there's not even a French version. So you have to kind of grit your teeth and try and read it. Uh, but actually, the part I'm talking about, uh, a lot of, somehow, bumps as something. Uh, bumps book is helpful. Uh, and what's going on here is, you see, I've written down, I've been, I've written down a representation of GL2 of K, right? Here, here's some representations of GL2 of K, and I wrote them down by somehow inducing up from some character. But that, I want more, it turns out there's more irreducible representations of GL2 of K. Uh, and how do I write down a representation of GL2 of K? So you use this amazing observation of V. Is that if K is any field at all, if K is any field, V realized that he could write down a presentation They constructed a presentation of SL2 of K, right? It's kind of an amazing thing. This is a kind of completely arbitrary, K is an arbitrary field. I mean, SL2 of K, you can certainly convince yourself that you know generators, right? We could look at kind of T0, 0, T inverse. Those are all in SL2 of K. Kind of 1, U, 0, 1. Those are all in SL2 of K. And what group do they generate? They're going to generate all the upper triangular matrices in SL2 of K. That's pretty easy to see. So now we definitely need a matrix that isn't upper triangular. So let's have 0, 1, negative 1, 0. Now we've got something that isn't upper triangular, but somehow that's it. Once you have all the upper triangular matrices and you have this one matrix here, uh, it turns out that every matrix in SL2 of K is either upper triangular or it's upper triangular times this matrix times upper triangular. That's not hard to check. So it's not difficult to check that these are generators, and it's also not difficult to spot relations amongst these generators. Right? For example, if I conjugate 1u01 by this matrix here, uh, then I'll get another matrix of the form 1v01, where v is equal to u times t squared. So it's not difficult to spot relations between these things. So if A wrote down these generators, and he wrote down a bunch of relations, and then he said, and that's it. He said, the abstract group generated by symbols, you know, A, T, and B, U, and W, subject to these relations, that abstract group clearly maps onto SL2 of K, surjectively, but it turns out it's an isomorphism. That's kind of an amazing, an amazing theorem of A. Uh, and using this amazing theorem of Ve, you now see now we have a presentation of SL2 of K. We have a, a strategy, we have a way of constructing representations of SL2 of K. All we have to do is think of a random vector space and then say how this acts, say how this acts, say how this acts, and then check that the relations hold. And then we just say, and now we've got a representation of SL2 of K. Right? Uh, so he was the generators. 
right? Plus the explicit obvious relations. And the big theorem was that these are all the relations. So as I say, I learned this is somewhere implicitly mentioned in Jack A. Langland, and I had no idea what was going on. And then when I looked at Bump's book, Bump kind of explains this quite carefully. You see, as an upshot, we can construct representations of SL2 of K, uh, you know, by... Uh, by giving explicit actions of, um, of these things here, t0, 0, t inverse, and, zero, and one, yeah, 1, u, 0, 1, and w on some complex vector space. So we just have to find a vector space, let these groups act, and, uh, and, then, and then check the relations, right? One of the relations is that this W squared is, is what you get here, is T0, 0, T inverse when T is negative 1, right? There's an example of a relation. So now all we've got to do, if we want to build some representations of SL, and of course SL2 of K is only an abelian group away from GL2 of K, right? So you could imagine that once we have SL2 of K, it might just be relatively easy to beef such a thing up to a representation of GL2 of K. So now all we need to do to use this crazy strategy of VE to build some representations of SL2 of K is we need to come up with a nice, nice big representation, a nice big vector space with some nice actions of these, of these random things here. Uh, and well, again, I think this is due to VE. I think this is the VE representation or the oscillator representation. Uh, so what VE did, so, uh, observed that this big vector space of functions that, uh, that we can use some a big, you know, a big vector space, e.g., a vector space of kind of a sensible, of, of, of I don't know, L2 functions on K. <laughs> so functions from K to C, which are kind of somehow some integral, you know, they're, they're kind of, they're locally constant and they're not too bad. Uh, and then this kind of T, this stuff here, T0, 0, T inverse, we can just scale, right? We can kind of go F of X, kind of goes to F of TX, that sort of thing. And then 1, U, 0, 1, that can be translation. F of x can go to F of u plus x, as it were. OK? And then how are we going to get this w? We've got some w involution to come up with. And if we do w squared, then we should end up with something kind of trivial. So we need to come up with some operation w, such that when you do it twice, you end up with basically F of x up to some funny twist. And so w turns out to be Fourier transform. <laughs> so some integral. And when you do the Fourier transform of the Fourier transform, you basically get back to the function you started with, modulo some fudge factor, and then you somehow that's the fudge factor. So this is just some explicit integral. You've got some function on K, and it's well behaved analytically. You can build some other function on K. So this gives you another huge source. So I'm not going to tell you about the details, but this gives you another huge source. of representations of GL2 of K, uh, or of, S of SL2 of K, you know, and hence GL2. You know, in certain cases, th these things extend to GL2 of K. So I'm not going to write down the explicit definition, but this is where it's coming from. Uh, so I will give you some notation. So it turns out. Uh, so given the following data, so here's a fact whose proof is embedded in Jack A. Langland's. If I have, if I have L over K, 
as a quadratic extension. There. And if I have if I have some character chi from L star to C star the submissible uh, and if chi is not equal to its Galois conjugate chi composed with uh, sigma with, uh, with one not equal to sigma in gamma over k then in Jacquet and Langlands Jacquet and Langlands construct an irreducible infinite dimensional representation uh, they don't call it what I'm going to call it but I'm going to, I'm going to give it a name uh, base change B C L K chi G L two of K. Okay, and it's just L two it's L two functions on L uh, plus some you know plus some tricks. You know, plus some Fourier transform. One of the problems with Jacquet and Langlands is that Langlands really likes to work in the correct generality. So for Langlands, the correct generality is K is an arbitrary local field, or sometimes possibly even an arbitrary local or global field. Uh, so for him, an arbitrary local field is these piadic fields, also maybe fine, you know, power series, power series rings over a finite field, but also the reals or the complexes. So, we, so sometimes you find them writing, uh, you know, they talk about bruha schwarz functions on K, and you look up Bruja Schwarz functions on Wikipedia, or, or eventually you discover that if K is the real numbers, then these are kind of like functions which are kind of decaying rapidly, and so are their derivatives. But if K is the periodic numbers, you can't find any definition of Bruja Schwarz function anywhere. And, but somehow there's one in Langlands' head. Uh, <laughs> although it's not explicitly mentioned in the book, and after a while you kind of convince yourself that it's probably a locally constant function with compact support or something. You know, something probably innocuous, but that he doesn't explain carefully. So this is tough to, this is tough to read, but it's, I'm not going to say any more about it. But the, the construction is of a very different nature to I of chi 1, chi 2, where we just explicitly write that. It's, it's kind of a slightly weird thing. Uh, so there we go. So I should say it's a theorem, I mean, it's theorem 4.6 of Jacques A. Langlands on page 72. Page 72 of the book. I can't guarantee what page of the PDF it is. Uh, right. So I've given you two tools, well I've sketched a tool that I haven't really said much about at all, but you can go and look in Bump and see what Bump. Do, and the nice thing about Bump, and what what happens in Bump's book is he explicitly constructs representations of SL2 of a finite field using this trick of V. And uh, somehow, when I read that trick, uh, it it made me feel far more confident that I could somehow, at some one point someday, convince myself of the existence of this thing here. Uh, Right, so let me tell you some facts. Have I done all these facts? Blah, 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 blah. I've done those facts. Great. So here we go then. Here are some facts. Uh, so this I of chi 1, chi 2, uh, An S of chi, comma, chi composed with the norm. Uh, uh, and this base change, and I put the L at the bottom. Chi. Maybe I'll change it to a. I'll put psi. Too late now. These things are all. 
are all infinite dimensional, smooth, and admissible. So there's a collection, uh, and uh, I mentioned already, you know, I have chi one, I have chi one comma chi two is irreducible. If chi one, if chi one over chi two isn't norm to the plus or minus one, yeah. and s, and this s of chi comma chi times norm, and base change uh, from l to k of psi, these are all, these are both uh, irreducible. So there's a huge collection of irreducible infinite dimensional representations. Uh, maybe they're all isomorphic though. I mean, maybe there's only three isomorphism classes of irreducible representations and I've just given every single one lots of names. So that's not what's going on. Uh, the only isomorphisms between these between these representations, it turns out that I of chi one comma chi two turns out to be isomorphic to I of chi two comma chi one. That's not easy to see. The intertwiner is subtle, uh, and I'll remark that if we'd use the naive normalization, then this wouldn't be true. This would all be messed up. There'd be norms everywhere, right? That's how you know that the calculation can't be completely trivial. Yeah, but it's going to involve interchanging the integral and another integral. Uh, this is for, for chi 1 over chi 2, not plus or minus 1. Right? The only non-trivial isomorphism, other than the identity isomorphisms of scalars, right? But here's an amazing thing. If p is bigger than 2, if the characteristic of the residue field is p, and p turns out to be bigger than 2, that's all of them. <laughs> These are all of the infinite dimensional admissible representation. Are all the infinite dimensional? Are all the infinite dimensional irreducible admissible representations of GL2K? That's hard work. That involves some counting. Uh, and somehow, and it doesn't work when p is 2. And it, if p is 2, it's really not true. If p is equal to 2, there are a few extra ones called exceptional representations. Uh, so I've explicitly defined some of these things and given you some vaguest of hints as to how to define other things. But what I'm claiming is that this is all of them. So that's kind of nice to know because I said something about the local Langlands conjectures bijecting rows with pies, and rows are maybe not so scary, and pies, I've just told you what all of them are for GL2. I haven't told you what they all are for GLN, but for GL2, this, you're looking at a complete list. Well, there's the finite dimensional ones, so I guess that's the last thing I should say. The only finite dimensional, the only finite dimensional pies, the finite dimensional irreducible admissible representations of GL2K. You see, I used to get really kind of confused by this. Like GL2 of K has got a really obvious two-dimensional representation on K squared, right? But that representation kind of isn't continuous because if you let it act on K squared, but you have to give K the discrete topology, uh, then stabilizers aren't open. Stabilizers are closed, but not open. So the obvious finite dimensional representations you can think of, like symmetric square representation, these are not good, because K on the left has its p-adic topology, but the coefficient field on the right has to have the discrete topology. So it's hard to write down irreducible admissible representations of this. So it turns out the only finite dimensional one's a one-dimensional one. A one-dimensional, one so they're factored through the abelianization, uh, which is debt, right, and of the form chi composed with debt uh, for chi k star to c star. Uh, so there you go. So I've written, I've completely, although we haven't proved things, I've nailed the right-hand side of the local Landers correspondence for GL2, as long as the character, characteristic of the residue field is bigger than 2. 
So that means there's now a chance that we can try and prove the local landless correspondence for GLT, assuming this, assuming this kind of counting, you know, assuming this sort of slightly messy representation theory. We should try and be able to prove local landless now by like writing down both sides and matching them up. So that's what I'll do. That's what I'll do tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, I guess I'll try and get everything local. Tomorrow will hopefully be the last local lecture. And then we'll move on to global stuff next week. Does that sound sensible? So it's a good nice. Oh, I'm supposed to say something. Thank you. Uh, two o'clock, everyone come here. We'll have a meeting. We'll see where, we'll see where we are. Right, I mean, you've got lots and lots of things to do, and you probably have plans for two o'clock. But what I'm saying is, could you postpone those plans to ten past two? We'll all meet here at two o'clock, and, uh, and, and we'll see where we are.